Hi everyone, this is Autopostrophe. Let's continue our game of Iwahime on Nin on PC. Such a habit to say Switch. I cover so many Switch games. Um, but this one is not on Switch, uh, surprisingly enough. I'm assuming at some point in time it will be. There's no reason why it can't be. そういう気持ちで書いたから素敵なのよ。もしこれが可愛さアピールで狙って書いてたら、すすはらくんはとんだ腹黒作詞ね。作詞やっぱりこれも計算なのか。やっぱりすすはらはグレートだぜ。よく
There was no way the school could allow that. And yet the whole school allowed Toei Kurakami. Classmates would wonder if she was a ghost or if the teachers couldn't see her. The very notion was ridiculous, of course, but no one laughed. For they understood she was an ominous presence they'd do best to not get involved with. In spite of that, the class was getting used to her existence and strange habits. April was almost at his end, and the whole class had already mostly stopped paying attention to her any mind. Forget passing. No one could even imagine her holding a pencil. Natsuya's comment was on point. It confounded the mind to the to envision how she had been allowed to join the school in the first place. Great money power de Uraguchi te waki kamuna. Sonna koto itcha waru yo. But everyone thought so. No one believed she had been accepted through the proper channels. The more one thought of her, the more of a mystery she became. それじゃ、テストとか補修とか大変じゃないかな。何もかも特例らしいぜ。補修にも出なくていいし、そもそもテストの順位表に名前も出ねえらしい。私の聞いた子もそう言ってた。学校側からその存在を無視されてるって。
くり案外進むって芯が強いんだね僕は人を見かけや噂話で評価しちゃいけないってずっと言われて育ってきた僕だって僕のことをよく知りもしない人に外見や噂なんかで勝手に判断されたくない小学校の頃は顔が女みたいだって言ってよくからかわれたんだ体がなよなよしていて男らしくないんだろうって一方的に言われてすごい嫌だったそれに関しては俺も返す言葉がねえ夏夜は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女は彼女なるほどな。意外にいい人かもしれないよ。Even though it looked like they understood, it didn't seem like they wanted to talk to Toei Kurakami either way. Apparently, it wouldn't be easy for them to erase the sinister impression of her they'd built up in their minds. なんだかそれが転校生の僕の使命のように思えてきたよ。使命またグレートなことを言い出すぜ。I don't know what happened last year, but that may be exactly why I need to be the one who talks to her. A flame had been lit within Suzumu. It was telling him to go talk to her. Perhaps there was something she needed as well. スズムは偉いね人の評価に惑わされず自分で確かめたいって気持ちすごく尊敬できるよ当たり前のことだと思うけどなでもねスズム愚者は経験に学ぶって言葉知ってる知らない何それ私もどこの偉人が言った言葉かは知らないけどでもネットで見たことがあるの愚者は経験に学び賢者は歴史に学ぶって I'd never heard that before, but I could guess what it meant. 10階建てのビルの屋上から飛び降りれば死ぬ誰でも知ってるよでもスズムはそれを自分で体験しない限り信じないって言ってる危険を避けるために人々の累積した知識歴史に耳を傾けるべき時もあるんじゃないかなそんな大げさな話じゃないよ黒神さんに話しかけたら僕が死んじゃうなんてあるわけがないそれはそうだけど。でもみんなが彼女を敬遠し薄気味悪く思い遠ざけるその蓄積された歴史を無視して我が身で確かめようとするスズムはひょっとしたらとんでもなく命知らずかもしれないよ。It hadn't been that long since I reunited with Kiko, but I'd never seen her look so serious. It was a shockingly stern expression, like the face of a mother, ma a mother makes when scolding her child for trying to run out into the street when the light was red.
Ooh, such haters. Mm. This is rather sudden. But my name is Yuto Akagato. Now that you have to remember it, everyone only calls me by my nickname. What sort of nickname is that? <laughs> Fatty Gala. If you ask the rest of the class about me, they'd say I was everyone's favorite laughingstock, the kind of person everyone makes fun of. You see those on variety shows all the time, right? Where the comedians get put through bizarre punishments and everyone laughs at them. Well, that was me. I was always the butt of such jokes. That day was no different. A comedian got stripped down to just his underwear and had embarrassing things written all over him with felt markers. The people on TV all had a good laugh. The viewers probably did the same. But I never laughed. I just felt sympathy for the comedian, seeing them like that. No, not sympathy. Fear. Because I knew. That would be me tomorrow. Oi, Debu! Aka Debu! Shiritori yaroze, shiritori! When lunch break came around, a bunch of crass guys would always force me to play with them. It was by no means popular. And though they called it playing, I was the only one getting played with. They were just looking for an excuse to put me through humiliating punishments for losing. It would go on until I lost, and recently they'd been coming up with unfair reasons to knock me out right off, right off the bat. If I didn't play along, or if I showed any displeasure, they'd get really violent. So all I could do was force a smile and take it. Better to be their plaything than their punching bag. Yes, this was better. See what I mean? I'd already resigned myself to this last night, so I was calm about it. They all tugged at my clothes, trying to force them off. It'd be a pain if I fought back only to lose a button, so I just gave an embarrassed smile and stripped myself. And once I was introduced to my briefs and shoes, they brought a mar marker out of nowhere. Called it. But it was an oil-based one. Getting this off wouldn't be easy. <laughs> they wrote all sorts of nasty comments on my stomach, back, thighs, and even briefs. And then they cackled, just like the people on TV. But here, no comedic music would play to soften the blow. My parents didn't care about me. Figures, given I was a wimp who'd been bullied his whole life. If they knew I was getting bullied, they'd just hit me and yell at me for being such a pushover. So I just put up with it. Throw away my underwear and wash off the writing in the bath so they wouldn't find out. But this trend just kept on going, and the crude comments on my body would escalate day after day. Worse, it's nearly impossible to wash off writing from oil-based markers. Water just doesn't cut it. You need to take a nylon towel and rub your skin really hard. As a result of doing this every day, my skin got raw and painful. It stung whenever the hot water touched it. That pain would serve as a constant reminder of how my body had been reduced to a sketchbook for bullies. Huh? All of a sudden, the lights went out. It was pitch black. Oddly enough, my thoughts ground to a halt too, as if time had stopped in the darkness. No point in getting worked up about it. My parents would surely take care of it. If I made a scene, they'd scold me for being a wimp who couldn't take care of himself. But just then, the shower stopped. It really did feel like time had stopped. What in the world was going on? All I could do was hear the labored breathing coming out of my nose. It scared me, like there was a terrifying demon just nearby. I heard a spine-tingling voice from the depths of hell at my back. 
It came from within the bathroom, right behind me. The words lingered and echoed off the walls. I couldn't stand the humiliation any longer. Normally, I could never give that ominous presence what it desired. But not only had it been another day of getting covered in embarrassing scribbles, some girls saw me and laughed this time. That bitterness urged me on. An elementary schooler was humming as he walked down the road, clearly in high spirits. The street was desolate. No one else was watching. If I was going to do it, then this was my chance. I approached him from behind, aimed for the back of his head, and... The whack. I ran for the hills. The boy's cries chased me like a specter, but I ignored them and dashed away. There, I did it. That boy was hit by a complete stranger out of nowhere. By bringing about that misery, I had given the thing what it wanted. I felt a little guilty, but that was outweighed by an overwhelming sense of triumph. Besides, it looked like that boy was coming back from school in a good mood. If he was that happy, it was only fair he shared some of it with me, so there was no need for me to feel bad. Right? Happy now? I kept up my end of the bargain. I could hear the thing laughing in the distance. That night, I waited in the bath for it to show up again, but it didn't. I kept washing my body and waiting for the lights to go out again, but they didn't. My body stung. It was itchy. Even after I went to bed and turned out the lights, my chest and back kept aching. The next day I checked my stomach to find it was swelling all reddish purple. But if I told my parents and it came out I'd been getting bullied, they'd scold me. It was okay. It'd go away if I just left it alone. Yes. kept throbbing during classes. I couldn't concentrate. I was in for yet another scribbling punishment during lunch break. But this time, the aching in my chest and back was more painful. The swelling there was chafing against my shirt. So having those guys take off my clothes and touch me would actually feel better. In fact, I just wanted to take off, take my clothes off myself. It was itchy, 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 itchy. And when I took off my shirt, the swelling finally stopped itching. My chest and back writhed in pleasure like worms after a rain. There were several purplish black swollen blobs pulsating on them, rejoicing in the fresh air. To me, they looked like one of those face assembly puzzles. Eyes, noses, mouths, those scattered parts protruded from my chest from the blobs and trembled. A 
cloudy, stringy secretions similar to phlegium gushed out of them. The demons had certainly kept its promise. After all, the looks of horror on the bullies made it clear they wouldn't even think about touching me now. I'd wish to never go through something like that again, and the thing granted it. Seeing the bullies fall comically on their backsides in terror felt a bit liberating, even. I was sure their days of bullying me were at an end. But all of a sudden, they kicked me to the ground. They kicked the eyes, noses, and mouths of the blobs on my chest and back over and over again, crushing them into paste. The blobs would gush that snot-like secretion with each kick, sticking like string to their shoes. As for me, well, I felt no pain. Far from it, I felt on top of the world for giving them the fright of their lives. Eventually, they kicked me so much that my whole body was swollen purple and became a blob itself. And so they continued stomping me, crushing me flat as I continued spewing that gooey secretion. In the end, I was reduced to nothing more than a reddish black puddle, like blood mixed with mucus, and faded away. Thus, they would never bully me again. However, I wish I'd been more specific with my wish. Like, I wish everyone who bullies me dies, or something. But if I had, I don't think hitting a kid in the head would have been enough to satisfy that demon. However, I made another wish. Kill them all. The demon's wish in exchange for that was surprisingly cheap. All I had to do was offer it the life of but a single student. Any student. But that was impossible. I no longer had a body. I couldn't kill someone, much less touch them. Hey, after hearing all this, you feel bad for me, right? Sympathize with poor old me and take my place. Sacrifice someone. Just one person is fine, okay? Come on, please. Sacrifice someone for me. Come on, please, please. <laughs> a giant lump of meat beyond any possible description writhed in the darkness. It had no arms, legs, or even a head, just a blob of flesh. Eyeballs, noses, and mouths poked out from all over it, spewing forth gooey phlegium from time to time. It was creeping closer and closer and closer. And then, red eyes flashed in the darkness. And it wasn't just two of them. Countless pairs of red eyes encircled the blob. They were small Japanese dolls. Endless numbers of the exact same doll clambered about. The blob found itself surrounded on all sides. Being dolls, they were completely expressionless. However, they clattered as they clambered over to the blob, one after another. By this point, the blob was nothing more than a piece of candy tossed into a swarm of ants. They could no longer see anything past the oncoming incursion of dolls. It howled as it squirted out several strands of phlegium like a water gun. The blob was clearly screaming in its death throes. But much like the piece of candy in the swarm of ants, the dolls showed the blob no mercy and devoured it whole. With howls and the occasional sound of spewing phlegium, the blob faded into the darkness. The doll, sitting at Toei's side, appeared to shake for a moment. その人形マジでさ、薄気味悪いんだけど。大切な人形だからそっとしておけ。うるさく言われてなかったら、そんな気味悪い人形。速攻ゴミ箱なのによ。There was a wet sound, followed by the sweet scent of saliva. Toei's lips shone sensually as a thin sliver of string trailed from them. And once more, she put the boy's toes right in her moist mouth.
やめんじゃねえよ続けろやグズ The boy kicked Toei in the chest with his bare foot. But like a dog, she groveled before him yet again. She started sucking his toes once more, like a baby with its mother's breast. The school's bike lot was empty except right before and after school, so, and so it had become a gathering spot for delinquents. Thus, delinquent groups would often meet up here during lunch and break and the like. About ten of them were here at this moment. They would curse, spit, and tell each other all sorts of crude stories with deplorable smiles on their faces. A ways apart from them was their leader, Sho Kamanuma, getting his toes sucked by Toei Kurokami. そう、さんって性癖変わってますよね。本当本当足より舐めさせるとこがあるでしょうに。俺はよ、そういうのはきちんとしてるわけ。そういうのは結婚するまでお預けする立場わけよ。つうかさ、それで先行来た時、焦
大丈夫かよ行ってよ行ってよすっげえバカ力だよこいつああ行って It was at that point that Duklikwas noticed Suzumu's unassumingly rugged fists. The lack of fear he showed when he faced their numbers made it easy to imagine he was trained in martial arts. He glared furiously at Suzumu, but didn't try to grab him again. Just then, the bell rang, signaling the end of lunch break. <laughs> さっきの乱暴を黒髪さんに謝らない限り僕も君のことは忘れないからああなめてんのかてめえこの場で知るかああ He hadn't imagined Suzumu would actually talk back Surging with white, white hot rage Sho pulled a metal bat out of a nearby bike's umbrella stand Suzumu finally looked surprised when he realized the shout had come from Tsubakiko. Shou left in a huff as the other delinquents tried to calm him down. So he staggered on after them. But before Suzumu could ask if she was okay, Toei pushed him away. And for the first time, the two looked each other in the eye. Though Toei's face was blank, her eyes were brimming with emotion, with tears and rejection. Her tears streaked downward and fell to the ground. Toei pushed Suzumu away again and left. Suzumu watched her leave as he reflected on her parting words. Why? You're too late. She said that. He knew. あつたくん、一緒に来たのに隠れてたでしょ。情けないな。そんなのじゃ、彼女できた時、愛想を尽かされちゃうよ。俺はまだ修行中の身だからな。女なんてまだまだ早えぜ。ありがとう、キコち
By the time class resumed, Kurokami was back in her seat, holding her doll and staring off into space like always. Why? You're too late. The way she was in class, I couldn't imagine her speaking her mind as clearly as that. I thought I knew what I'd heard, but I was starting to wonder if it was my mind playing tricks on me. Kurokami. What did she mean by too late? I used to be so indifferent, but I found that I couldn't get my mind off her for some reason. Too late, as in past the point of no return. But what? What didn't I make it in time for? Black snow started gently falling between us. No, not snow. Soot. Jet black soot piled up, burying me in Kurakami's world in darkness. The final class of the day ended and my classmates filed out of the room, one after another. But instead, I walked over to Kurakami. Kurakami said nothing. That silence was a clear affirmation that by too late she was indeed referring to me. Her eyes were glazed over. Nothing I said was getting to her. There was nothing more I could say to keep her there. Alright, why don't we stop it there. Uh, this is Autopostrophe. You've been watching Iwahime on PC. Uh, it's getting interesting, huh? Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching. I will see you at the next stream.